This video is about the anatomy and physiology of the human heart. The learning objectives that we'll cover include the basic structures of the heart. We'll also talk about cells in the heart, pacemaker myocytes, as well as contractile myocytes. We'll talk about the events of the cardiac cycle. We'll also talk about the pumping action of the heart and the amount of blood the heart pumps called cardiac output. First, I wanted to show a short video clip that shows a human heart beating, and it's a product used for heart transplantation. Right now, transplanting a human heart is still extremely difficult for three reasons. One, the supply is very limited. Only a very small number of organ donors end up actually donating viable hearts, and not all of those make it into recipients. Two, you can't just swap out a heart. The heart and recipient have to be a good enough match. But the biggest problem is that you only have six hours to work with. The longer the heart is outside of the body, the riskier it is to implant that heart. And the reason these problems are such problems are because of this. Despite all the advances we have made in the past 40 years in modern medicine, we still are dependent on a cooler and a time clock that we are w working against. After the heart is removed from a donor, it's attached to what is called the organ care system, or OCS. It's kept warm, it's fed nutrients, it circulates blood, and it's essentially kept alive. Now there's no longer a race against the clock. OCS allows us to take that variable out of the equation. Organ care system technology has the potential to revolutionize the way we practice solid organ transplantation. Heart in a box is going to replace the old therapy. Nothing to do with ice. So you can see the heart beating away inside this preservation product and the heart's able to beat outside the body because of the pacemaker cells in the heart allow it to actually regulate its own contraction and of course this uh, product keeps it warm and oxygenated and allows it to survive outside the body. Our first learning objective is to really just introduce the structures of the cardiovascular system. The heart is our pump the blood vessels are these tubes that will carry blood uh, around the body and we've learned about blood in a previous video. So remember the heart is basically a muscular pump. Cardiac myocytes allow it to contract and push blood uh, and create pressure and of course the heart is going to pump uh, out to the body uh, and to the lungs and so I wanted to show you a bit of a model or schematic of our cardiovascular system so um, this schematic we'll use for a couple of these videos so basically we have our heart and our heart pumps into arteries arteries carry blood away from the heart arteries then go into smaller and smaller blood vessels till we reach these microscopic arteries which we call arterioles. Arterioles control the resistance in our cardiovascular system and they control the blood flow to our organs. The smallest little blood vessels that we have are fed by those arterioles and they're called capillaries. Capillaries allow things like exchange of oxygen. And then our blood funnels into microscopic venules uh, which are just microscopic veins eventually reaching veins and then being returned back to our heart so the job of veins are to return blood back to our heart so sometimes we'll talk about venous return so that's our cardiovascular system and the heart creates the pressure in order to move that blood around those blood vessels and I just wanted to show some uh, statistics here and some numbers here to show you how much work your heart does. Your heart has to beat all day, every day, every minute, and you can see it has to beat a lot of times. And then how much does it actually pump? Well, even just right now at rest watching this lecture, your heart's pumping about five liters per minute. And you can see in a day, in a year, in a lifetime, that's a lot of pumping. When you exercise your um, cardiac output or the volume of blood that the heart pumps could reach 10, 15, even 25 liters of blood per minute pumped around your body. The next learning objective is to look at the layers, tissues, and cells that make up our heart wall and the pericardium. And so in lab, we'll dissect the heart and we'll see that it's surrounded by a protective pericardium. And now we're going to talk about the actual tissue that makes up that pericardium and the heart wall. 
So if we look at a heart wall, we're really just talking again about tissues. Any organ in the body, remember, we're just talking about connective tissue and muscle tissue and epithelial tissue. So we'll start on the blood side. The blood side is the inside of the heart, the pumping chamber on the inside is filled with blood. And so we're gonna need some connective tissue. And so we have some connective tissue and we're going to need to cover the inside surface of the heart with simple squamous epithelium. That simple squamous epithelium is called endothelium or endothelial cells. So again, endothelial cells line all your blood vessels and your heart. They're supported by collagen and elastin and this thin membrane or uh, structure of protein called the basement membrane. Together, that connective tissue and that endothelium are called the endocardium. And that's the inner layer of the heart. So now if we build the middle structure of the heart wall, that's going to consist mostly of connective tissue and lots of cardiac myocytes. The little cardiac myocytes have things like actin and myosin that we expect muscle cells to have, and they're all interconnected, and they're supported by lots of collagen and lots of elastin. We also need things like blood vessels and nerves to go into our heart wall as well. So we fill that up there now. We've got lots of our little cardiac myocytes, which are their job is to contract. They're probably more like your type 1 skeletal myocytes if we had to compare them. We have lots of arteries and veins. We call those coronary arteries and cardiac veins that support our, our middle muscle layer. We also have parasympathetic and and, and sympathetic neurons and sensory neurons and things like that. We have lots of collagen and elastin. And this middle layer of our heart, all those heart cells in the connective tissue, is called the myocardium. All right, so, so far we've done endocardium, myocardium, and now we're going to build the outside surface of the heart. And so again, it's more connective tissue. We need to cover the surface of the heart with simple squamous epithelial cells, and we call that layer of cells the mesothelium because they're mesothelial cells. They're supported again by basement membrane and connective tissue. Mesothelioma is a cancer of that, those mesothelial cells. The other thing we find in this layer is lots, of, again, of collagen and lots of elastin. We also see lots of adipocytes packed in there. So adipose tissue in this layer uh, is very common. It's probably for cushion and also to create some space and protection for those little coronary vessels uh, in this outer part of the heart. So those coronary vessels probably need some cushion so they don't get too squished by that adipose tissue. Again, this collagen, this elastin, the adipose tissue, and the protective covering of mesothelial cells is called the epicardium, or you may, may remember it called the visceral pericardium. Most of the time we just call it the epicardium. And then we need to put that Ziploc bag around the heart. That Ziploc bag uh, is made of connective tissue some covering mesothelial cells, and some maybe some fat as well. And this is called the pericardium. So this connective tissue epithelial layer is called pericardium. There's a little bit of fluid between that Ziploc bag and the heart. So again, this layer of connective tissue and mesothelium with the fluid between it, called pericardial fluid in the pericardial space, this is called the pericardium or you might remember it from lab a long time ago, called the parietal pericardium. Most of the time, doctors and nurses will just call this Ziploc bag around the heart the pericardium. All right, so we've got our heart layers, our heart wall. We've got the pericardium, which is the Ziploc bag. We've got the epicardium, the outer surface of our heart. We've got the myocardium, the middle layer for contracting, and then the endocardium, which lines the inside of our heart. So that's the heart wall. Next, we want to identify the major structures, chambers, and valves and do a little bit of heart anatomy. So you can always draw a heart like a Valentine's Day heart. The heart has four chambers. It also has a septum or wall between the chambers which divide the right and left. So remember, we have four chambers. The bottom and main pumping chambers are called ventricles. These are the real pumps for the heart. We have these top filling chambers or receiving chambers 
called atria or atrium singular. So venous return occurs in the atria. We have a right atrium, a right ventricle, a left atrium, a left ventricle. And that's the heart. Again, the atria fills. So in this case, the left atrium is filling with blood. We have these one-way valves that separate the atria from the ventricles. And most of the valves, all the valves in the heart, are one-way valves, like one-way doors. So they're pushed open by the blood and the blood pressure, and then blood can flow through those valves. So in the case here, we're showing the filling valves opening up because of blood pressure in the atria, causing filling of the ventricles. Those one-way filling valves have names. The left side is called the bicuspid or mitral valve, and the right side is called the tricuspid valve. All right, so on the left side, we have the mitral valve. On the right side, we have the tricuspid valve. What about when we want to empty the heart? So we have emptying uh, tubes that come out of the heart. Out of the left ventricle is this big giant artery called the aorta. And we have a valve that separates the left ventricle from the aorta. Again, a one-way valve, and we call that valve the aortic valve. I like to think of it as an exiting valve. The aortic valve will open, and blood can flow then into your aorta from your left ventricle. Again, it's a one-way valve. What about the right ventricle? The right ventricle pumps and pushes into a really large artery too. In this case, it's going to the lungs, so we call this the pulmonary artery. It's a short artery, so sometimes it's called the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary artery has a one-way valve called the pulmonary valve. So when the right ventricle pushes blood, it pushes it through that pulmonary valve, and that blood then goes to your lungs. Again, when we look at our heart and we draw it more anatomically, it's got four chambers. It has this wall that separates the sides called the septum. Uh, at the top, it's called the atrial septum. At the bottom, it's called the ventricular septum. And we don't want any holes in that septum. Uh, you may hear about that in some little kids. Okay, so let's take all the blood from our body and return it to our heart. It's going to return through these giant veins called vena cava to our right atrium. And that blood comes from your head, your arms, your legs. There's a superior vena cava and an inferior vena cava, and they drain the blood into the right atrium. And this is basically venous return from your body back to your heart. So that right atrium receives the blood. The blood eventually then pushes open that one-way valve, that little one-way valve we call the tricuspid valve, and our blood then f uh, fills into our right ventricle. That right ventricle is going to actually eject blood through this pulmonary artery, and that blood can then go to our lungs. So again, the right ventricle pumps into the pulmonary artery through that little pulmonary valve. The blood then goes to your lungs and can pick up things like oxygen and drop off CO2. Once the blood's in the lungs and it picks up oxygen and drops off CO2, it's going to want to go back to your heart. And so blood from our lungs actually returns to our left atrium through pulmonary veins. Remember, veins always return blood to the heart. So in this case, the pulmonary veins that come from our left lung and also our right lung drain blood back to the left atrium. Here we're drawing in the right pulmonary veins, which again bring blood back to our left atrium. Drawing the blood here red because it's more oxygenated now that it's left the lungs. After the blood fills the right atrium, the blood pressure pushes open that valve. That one-way valve is the mitral valve. The blood fills our left ventricle. When the left ventricle contracts, it squirts the blood into that, gi that giant large artery called the aorta. So remember, to get into the aorta, it must pass through the aortic valve. The aorta then carries blood to your head, to your arms, to your chest, and basically your legs and all over your body. Remember that one-way valve in the aorta is called the aortic valve. 
And that's basically the pumping action of the heart. I just wanted to show you the um, action of one of these valves. This case is showing the left side of the heart, and so you're going to actually see the mitral valve. The mitral valve has two little flaps or leaflets connected to little cords called chordae tendinae. The chordae tendinae you can actually see here, we're actually in the left atrium looking down at that mitral valve and you can see the two flaps. You can even see the little cords which are anchored to the inside of your heart wall through things called papillary muscles. Remember that these valves are only opened and closed by the blood pressure and the blood pushing against them. So the blood pressure pushes the valve open and the blood pressure pushes the valve closed. And you can see those cords connected to papillary muscles, those really just hold those valves shut. And you would see those on the tricuspid valve as well. And sometimes these valves can become leaky. And we'll talk more about that. What is a heart attack? You may have heard of a heart attack called a myocardial infarction, or sometimes on TV shows, an MI. Well, part of your heart wall actually starts to die and to become damaged due to lack of blood flow. And so remember, the heart wall is our myocardium. And if that myocardium and endocardium doesn't get supplied blood, those cells can actually start to die off and not work correctly. And then that affects the pumping ability of your heart. Remember, all the cells in the body need oxygen. And they need oxygen, most of them, need lots and lots of oxygen to make ATP. And so in the case of the heart, of course, we need lots and lots of oxygen so those little myocytes can generate uh, ATP and contract. Well, it turns out our heart wall has its circulation coming off the aorta. Remember, the aorta is that big giant blood vessel which supplies blood to your whole body, including your heart. So to the left side coming off the aorta, we have the left coronary artery branches. These coronary arteries basically nourish the heart wall itself. Coming off the right side of our aorta, we have the right coronary artery, which serves the uh, structures as the heart on that side. If these coronary arteries are ever blocked, for example, your left anterior descending artery, if it's blocked, all the heart wall and heart muscle tissue downstream of that block will become damaged and possibly die. And so again, we'd obviously need to fix that block with something like a stent, which is a little cage to open up that blocked artery. Or maybe you need to have bypass surgery where you take an artery or a vein and sew it onto your aorta and then sew it on downstream of that blocked coronary artery. If you have three of these blockages and have to have three little coronary bypass vessels sewn onto your aorta, you would have triple bypass surgery. So coronary artery bypass surgery is basically sewing on blood vessels uh, to help with these blockages. Sometimes we use arteries or leg veins in order to do that sort of bypass surgery. So that's the coronary circulation that serves the heart itself. And here you can actually see where they harvest. They harvest one of these large veins, superficial veins in your leg called the saphenous vein or great saphenous vein. And so you can imagine that surgery on your leg actually might be more of a pain than the surgery on your heart. Next, we're going to trace a molecule pump from the right side versus the left side of our heart. So remember, our heart is separated right and left by that septum. And so the right atrium fills into the right ventricle. The right ventricle pumps blood to our lungs, and it pumps blood to our lungs through the pulmonary artery or pulmonary trunk. So remember, the blood gets from our heart to our lungs via the right ventricle. So the right side of our heart is really just pumping to the lungs. If we look at the left side, the left side of our heart, the left atrium, gets that blood back from our lungs, that oxygenated blood. The left atrium then helps fill the blood into the left ventricle. The left ventricle fills with blood. Once the left ventricle contracts, it's going to push the blood out to the entire body 
through the aorta. So the aorta, either indirectly or directly through its branches, is going to deliver blood to your head, your arms, your brain, your abdominal cavity, your chest cavity, your legs. So basically, our left heart pumps to our entire body. So the left ventricle is actually a much stronger pump in a much thicker, thicker wall because that left ventricle has to generate high pressure and pump into your aorta to your whole body. And so when we talk about blood pressure, we're talking about um, that in our, in our large arteries. The right side of our heart, since it's fairly thin-walled and only needs to pump next door to its lungs, actually has a fairly low pressure. We don't usually talk about that pressure, but it's much lower than the arterial pressure on the left side. So the heart is really basically two pumps side by side, right and left, stuck to each other by that septum. So we can look at this again more conceptually. If we think about it, here's our left heart, again our left atrium, our left ventricle, and our right heart, which includes our right atrium and our right ventricle. And if we look at the pumping or circulation, we can see that we have two pumps, uh, and we're going to actually see that they pump in series. So again, blood from our left atrium flows through that mitral valve into our left ventricle. The left ventricle pumps into our aorta through that aortic valve. The aorta then delivers blood throughout the entire body, your entire body. That body then returns back to the heart through these large veins called vena cava. These large veins drain into our right atrium. The right atrium flows pushes blood and helps blood flow into our, fill into our right ventricle through the tricuspid valve. The right ventricle pumps to our lungs through those pulmonary arteries. Blood then reaches our lungs, gets oxygenated, drops off CO2, and then the blood returns from our lungs back to our heart through pulmonary veins and eventually reaches our left atrium. So that's the circulation through um, our basically our body. It goes from our left heart to our body, back to the right heart, from our right heart to the lungs, and then back to the heart, and round it, round it goes. So that's the circulation. We call the right side and the circulation to our lungs the pulmonary circulation. So pulmonary circulation is from our right ventricle to our lungs, and then back to our heart. The left side of our heart and the left ventricle pumps to our whole body. We call this the systemic circulation. And this is usually the blood pressure that we think about uh, when we talk about uh, high blood pressure or 120 over 80 is our systemic circulation. Normal blood pressure might be 100 over 60. All right, our next learning objective is to describe these little heart cells in our heart, which are basically all cardiac myocytes. Some of our little cardiac myocytes are going to function more as pacemaker cells or pacemaker myocytes because they have really fast, spontaneous action potentials. So they're going to pace the heart. Our contractile myocytes, they're going to follow the leader and follow the pacemaker cells. Their job is to generate force. So they're going to do most of the pumping action. So all the cells in our heart have action potentials, but the pacemaker ones have faster action potentials, and they pace the rest of the cells. Remember that skeletal muscle and skeletal muscle myocytes have to be activated by neurons, otherwise they will not contract. So a little skeletal muscle fiber or myocyte will only contract when a motor neuron gets activated by your brain or your spinal cord, releases acetylcholine, that acetylcholine then triggers an action potential. That action potential causes um, depolarization of your entire little muscle cell. Remember, that then causes contraction. So only when a neuron tells a skeletal muscle cell to contract will it contract. The heart's cool that it has pacemaker myocytes that allow it to contract all by itself. It doesn't need the brain to tell it to do anything. Just speed up or slow down. So the fast 
fastest pacemaker myocytes are found in these little regions of the heart. Probably the fastest ones are found in the right atrium. And they're going to pace the heart. The rest of the little contract-down myocytes are just going to follow the lead of the pacemaker myocytes and the cells around it. So this is how it works. All cardiac myocytes have an action potential and then contract with each heartbeat. So no myocytes rest. They all contract every time. Every time the heart beats, every myocyte gets activated. Uh, like follow the leader. It starts in your right atrium. These little pacemaker cells send out action potentials. They spread through another little special region down to the ventricles. And then all those little ventricular myocytes, cell to cell, activate each other. And so every little cell has an action potential and then contracts. All right, so activation of heart muscle cells is from cell to cell to cell. Cells activate their neighbor cells. That's very different than skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle cells only get activated specifically when a neuron tells them to. All right, so let's imagine a little pacemaker muscle cell, pacemaker myocyte. It has these really fast action potentials. So it's negative on the inside because potassium left. Then suddenly sodium and calcium rushes in and it has an action potential. That action potential is going to spread by nearby myocytes. They have these little protein uh, link-ups or protein junctions between them called gap junctions that allows things like sodium and calcium to rush from cell to cell, which triggers more sodium and more calcium to enter our little cell. And so it has an action potential. And then, of course, it contracts. So all the little cardiac myocytes are hooked up by these little proteins called gap junctions. So myocytes are coupled or connected electrically. And so when one cell has an action potential, the sodium and the calcium spread from cell to cell, which triggers more calcium and more sodium to enter the little cell. And so in that way, the action potential of one cell triggers the action potential of the next cell next to it. And then, of course, that triggers contraction. So the electrical impulses spread throughout the heart from cell to cell to cell, which then triggers contraction of all the little cells of your heart. So again, an action potential occurs, which is sodium rushing in, calcium rushing in, calcium released from the SR. The calcium triggers um, troponin, and troponin moves tropomyosin which hopefully you remember allows myosin, which uses ATP, to power and grab onto actin. And that's contraction. So in this way, the action potential triggers this calcium, which triggers contraction. Just like skeletal muscle with a couple slight differences. Skeletal muscle needs acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter, to tell it to allow sodium to rush in and to have an action potential which triggers the release of calcium from the SR, which causes those proteins, myosin and actin, to interact. Myosin grabs actin, and you get contraction. So skeletal myocytes are very similar, uh, but slight differences. Where are neurons involved in the heart? Well, in the case of our autonomic nervous system, we might want to increase or decrease our heart rate. But you don't need that autonomic nervous system to tell your heart to contract. So again, cardiac myocytes action potential is a tiny bit different than the action potential we've been drawing for neurons and skeletal muscle cells. And it's just different in one slight way. So a cardiac myocyte action potential is a little longer. When we looked at a neuron, or a skeletal muscle action potential, it was very quick. It went up, went positive, and then came back down to negative. So well, why are they different? Well, they're at rest, they're just like the rest of the cells we've learned. Some potassium leaves our little cells, and the inside of the cell is negative. We trigger an action potential, and a bunch of sodium rushes in and makes the inside of our cell very positive. Where cardiac myocytes are different is now calcium rushes in from outside the cell, which keeps it positive for a little while. And then potassium rushes out, and we go back down to negative, 
and back to rest. Of course, the whole point of this action potential was basically to get calcium into the cell and released from the SR so that we could have contraction. The action potential sets up calcium for contraction. Again, if we look at our cardiac myocyte action potential, we see it's slightly different with this flattened plateau phase due to calcium rushing in, keeps it positive, and then we go back to negative due to potassium. So that's the cardiac myocyte action potential. Again, if we look at our heart and draw in our heart anatomy, we've got a right atrium or right ventricle, our left atrium or left ventricle, and of course a septum divides the sides. The fastest pacemaker cells in the heart are in the sinoatrial node, or SA node. And those little pacemaker myocytes, they go at about a rate of 80 to 100 action potentials per minute. So that's the fastest pacemaker myocytes in the heart, and the normal pacemaker of the heart. So really, any myocyte in the heart could be a pacemaker, uh, but normally all the cells follow the SA node. Say you have a little myocyte down in your ventricle which decides, I want to be the pacemaker, uh, that could trigger an arrhythmia or an ectopic or sort of skipped beat. Uh, so sometimes little myocytes elsewhere in our heart can take over, uh, but that would be abnormal. If your brain wants to change the activity of the heart, it can regulate the speed of your heart rate. Uh, through the autonomic nervous system, right? Norepinephrine speeds the heart up, acetylcholine slows the heart down. That would be targeting the SA node. Your sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic nervous system can regulate the force of contraction, uh, again using things like norepinephrine to increase force. If you were to cut those nerves from your autonomic nervous system off to your heart, then the heart would simply uh, just sort of beat on its own uh, without that sort of influence to the SA node from your autonomic nervous system. In some cases, the pacemakers uh, or some of the regions of the heart will not be working properly to pace the heart. You may need to get an implantable pacemaker, which is basically a battery-operated little uh, unit that can pace the heart and tell those little ventricles when to contract. So the heart has a conduction system. The conduction system really is just speci specialized myocytes, and their job is to spread those action potentials to different regions of the heart, and really it's all about timing. So again, the SA node starts all of this, and the SA node has the fastest pacemaker cells. Then the action potential spreads from atrial myocyte to atrial myocyte. Unfortunately, the electrical activity can't get down to the ventricles, without a specialized little region called the atrioventricular node. So the AV node is the only electrical connection between the atria and the ventricles because of this connective tissue that separates the chambers. Once at the AV node, the little myocytes called the bundle branches and Purkinje fibers spread basically the action potential through the entire ventricle very quickly and allow those little ventricular myocytes then to spread the action potentials from cell to cell to cell and that causes then our ventricles to become electrically active. So this is called the conduction system of the heart. It starts in the SA node, spreads through the atria to the AV node, through the bundle branches and Purkinje fibers all throughout your ventricles. And it's all about timing of the electrical activity. So the atria are electrically active first, and then that electrical activity spreads to the ventricles, and then the ventricles are electrically active. And not surprising, that then makes the atria contract slightly before the ventricles contract. So again, the electrical impulses spread through our heart. The electrical impulses begin in the atria, and then spread to the ventricles. And we can actually see this electrical activity, the timing of it, in what's called the ECG or electrocardiogram, and actually measure that on the skin surface. So the first little blip is called the P wave. The P wave is when all those little atrial myocytes depolarize. The QRS wave or QRS complex is when all your little ventricular myocytes depolarize. And then the T wave is when all your little ventricular myocytes repolarize and go back to negative. You can't really see atrial repolarization. 
So the electrocardiogram or the electrical activity of the heart can be measured on the skin surface and we call that an ECG. And you can take just four little stickers and stick it around your limbs, hook it up to a computer, and that electrocardiogram can actually measure the electrical activity of the heart chambers. First with the little P wave, then the QRS, and then the T. So each time you see those series of waves, you know that the heart must be beating. But an ECG or an EKG is only electrical activity of the heart. So those billions of little cardiac myocytes are having their little action potentials and on the skin surface you can see this electrocardiogram. So again in a normal electrocardiogram you can see a P, Q, R, S, T and they always follow in that pattern. If you speed up the heart you can just see that those same waves are occurring quicker and heart rate is higher. If you slow the heart rate down you can see the P, Q, R, S, T, they're really just spread out. So remember that electrical activity sets up the mechanical or contractile activity. A famous arrhythmia is called atrial fibrillation. In this case, the little atrial myocytes are basically electrically active chaotically, and so you can see the P, you can't really see a P wave at all, but the QRS seems fairly normal. Every once in a while you might get a premature ventricular electrical activity which can cause a skipped beat and a little ventricular myocyte decides to pace the heart. Sometimes in an extreme case a group of ventricular myocytes can begin pacing the heart in what's called ventricular tachycardia. Sometimes this can become ventricular fibrillation where every single cell in the heart is electrically active at its own time and the heart doesn't pump which you can imagine is deadly. The next learning objective is to cover the events of the cardiac cycle. So the cardiac cycle, the heart's basically either resting or contracting and pumping. And it cycles between rest, contraction, rest, contraction. So let's take a, an easy look at what's called the cardiac cycle. So if we consider the cardiac cycle, the heart can be resting so when it's resting, we can call it relaxing. And usually during this time, it's filling with blood. And we call this diastole. So if we were a cardiac physiologist or cardiologist, we'd call this resting, relaxation, filling phase of the cardiac cycle diastole. Then that electrical activity causes that heart to contract. So when it's contracting, it's pumping or ejecting blood either to the lungs or to the body. We call this phase systole. So this phase of the cardiac cycle, where the ventricles are actually pumping and squeezing and contracting, we call that systole. In this case, we're looking more at the left ventricle, so we would look at the aorta. And if we look at the right ventricle, we would look at the pulmonary artery going to the lungs. So the heart basically cycles between diastole filling and systole ejecting or pumping. And so that's why we call it the cardiac cycle. Again, the electrical activity sets up these periods of relaxation and contraction, and we cycle back and forth. All right, so the cardiac cycle, we're basically cycling between periods of relaxation, contraction, relaxation, contraction. We call it diastole, systole, diastole, systole and we cycle between these different states. Each time we're in systole, the heart beats. Each time we're in diastole, the heart fills. So whenever you think of diastole, think of filling. Whenever you think of systole, think of ejecting or pumping. And the heart cycles between these different periods due to the electrical activity of the heart. If we looked at the electrical activity of the heart, that ECG, the PQRS, would trigger systole. If we look at our arterial blood pressure, we'd see that the arterial blood pressure spikes during systole and then drops off during diastole because of the action of the ventricles. And if we look just at the left ventricle, we could see the pressure is very low during diastole and then spikes during systole. So the left ventricle generates the pressure to pump the blood and then raises your arterial blood pressure during systole. Now we're going to take a little bit of an advanced look at the cardiac cycle. 
So if we look at this diagram and this animation, we can see that the heart cycles between filling, ejecting, filling, ejecting. So it cycles between systole and diastole. And if we freeze it and look at specific parts of the cycle, we can look at some of the specific events. So let's pause here during diastole. So here the heart is filling during diastole. The chambers are all relaxed. The ventricles are relaxed. Our filling valves must be open. So the tricuspid and the bicuspid valves are open and the heart fills. Then the electrical activity triggers contraction starting in the atria and then the ventricles. When the ventricles contract, we generate pressure in the heart. We generate pressure that closes the filling valves. We haven't generated enough pressure to open the aortic or pulmonary valves yet. And so we call this isovolumetric contraction because the heart's neither filling or emptying. Then that ventricle actually generates enough force to open the exiting valves. The pulmonary valve and the aortic valve open and the heart now is ejecting blood into the aorta or the pulmonary artery. And then the heart starts to relax. When the heart starts to relax, the pressure drops in those ventricles. And now we actually see that all the valves are closed again, the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve closed. The filling valves have not yet opened because the pressure hasn't dropped enough. We call that isovolumetric relaxation. Now we're in diastole again. Eventually, the pressure in our atria is larger than the pressure in our relaxing ventricles, and it pushes open, open our filling valves. Again, the tricuspid, bicuspid valves open up, and we fill our left and our right ventricles. Again, this is during diastole. So most of the heart is filling uh, just when it's relaxing. And then we shift back to systole. We begin the contraction again. We eject blood and round and round the cycle we go. All right, so that's in a more advanced look, uh, keeping in mind when the valves open and close during diastole and systole. Okay, so remember, diastole, we're filling the heart. Systole, we're contracting and emptying the heart. And we're just cycling between these states, so that's why we call it the cardiac cycle. If we look at aortic pressure or arterial blood pressure, we can see that it spikes during systole. And so sometimes we call that systolic blood pressure. Again, then it goes down during diastole because the heart is relaxing and it's not pumping blood. So that's why your, your arterial blood pressure fluctuates between a high pressure and a low pressure. The ventricle is what causes this pressure spike in your arteries when it actually ejects blood during systole. So remember, during diastole, your ventricle is filling through that open mitral valve, if we just look at the left side. And so we're filling our heart until systole starts. When the left ventricle contracts, the mitral valve closes. We contract, 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 and generate pressure. That pressure opens the aortic valve. When the aortic valve opens, then we have ejection of blood from our left ventricle into our aorta, and that spikes our arterial blood pressure so that they're matched. Then that little ventricle relaxes again, the aortic valve closes. When we relax our ventricle, the pressure goes way, way down in that little ventricle, so much so that the mitral valve opens back up, and now we fill our left ventricle with blood. Again, this is during diastole until we get back to systole where we contract our left ventricle and the cycle begins again. The left ventricle contracts, ejects blood into our aorta, and our arterial blood pressure goes up. The next learning objective is to distinguish between the factors that change cardiac output from the heart. So basically cardiac output is how much does the heart pump, how much blood does the heart pump per minute from each ventricle. So in one minute, how many liters of blood is the heart pumping? That's cardiac output. The factors that affect it are heart rate, stroke volume, venous return, which affects stroke volume, and contractility, which is the force of contraction, which affects stroke volume as well. 
So when we talk about cardiac output from the heart, it's basically the same for the left ventricle and the right ventricle. They pump the same amount, so we're really just going to focus on the left side or left ventricle. So cardiac output is defined mathematically as heart rate multiplied by stroke volume. So in this case, we're looking at the left ventricle and saying, how much does that left ventricle pump per minute? So we need to know how often we pump. So that's heart rate. In this case, let's say 60 beats per minute. Stroke volume is how much blood is ejected from that ventricle per beat. So if we look at our left ventricle, and let's say our left ventricle fills up with some amount of blood, let's say it's filled up with 300 mils of blood, if during contraction, each contraction, that ventricle ejects or pushes out 100 mils of blood, that would be stroke volume. So stroke volume is the amount you eject per beat. In this case, 100 mils of blood per beat. Multiply those together and you get cardiac output. In this case, 6,000 mils of blood per minute are being pumped by the heart, or simply 6 liters of blood per minute. So cardiac output is constantly adjusted up and down during the day. So for example, how would we increase our cardiac output? Well, your autonomic nervous system can increase your heart rate through the sympathetic nervous system. It can also adjust contractility, which is the force of contraction of those little myocytes. Again, through norepinephrine, each little myocyte generates more force during each contraction. That will increase your stroke volume. So if you increase heart rate and stroke volume, you increase cardiac output. The parasympathetic nervous system has the opposite effect through acetylcholine of decreasing heart rate, decreasing stroke volume, and decreasing cardiac output. So basically we're targeting our little pacemaker myocytes with heart rate, or we're targeting our little contractile myocytes in terms of contractility. Uh, through our autonomic nervous system. So norepinephrine, interestingly, can adjust the force of contraction of those little cardiac myocytes. We call that contractility. It seems to be involved in calcium regulation. So each little myocyte then generates more force, contracts with more force, and that affects your stroke volume. I just wanted to remind you that things like norepinephrine and acetylcholine bind to protein receptors in the membrane. So for example, norepinephrine binds to the beta receptors. Let's look at an example where cardiac output is affected. So in an example where you become really, really dehydrated, what can happen is you lose blood volume. So because you're sweating so much, your blood volume is reduced. This decreases venous return to the heart, which decreases your stroke volume. The heart can't eject as much blood per beat, which causes your cardiac output to become reduced. This can cause your blood pressure to drop, which your brain doesn't like. But through homeostasis and regulation of blood pressure, your autonomic nervous system can adjust your cardiac output back up by activating heart rate. So by activating and increasing your heart rate, you can hopefully actually bring that cardiac output more towards normal, even though your stroke volume is reduced. So that's an example of homeostasis. Again, cardiac output changes a lot. For example, when you exercise, you need to increase cardiac output to get more blood to your working muscles. One way to do that is simply increasing your heart rate. Another way, though, is to increase venous return, which increases stroke volume. One of the things your muscles do is squish your veins. Another way your autonomic nervous system can increase cardiac output when you exercise is to make each little myocyte contract with more force. We call that contractility. So when you exercise, your cardiac output can go up maybe to 15 or 20 liters per minute in order to deliver more blood to your body. So that's it for cardiac output. See you guys.